The 10th of May, 1940, World War II, the Netherlands. Nazi Germany invades Holland, and the German air forces, the Luftwaffe, use paratroopers in the capture of tactical points and to assist in the advance of ground troops across the country. The invasion is accompanied by heavy aerial bombardment of Rotterdam and culminates on the 14th of May with the destruction of its entire historic center. Because the Germans threatened to bomb the city of Utrecht in the same way, the Dutch forces surrender one day later. Soon after, the Nazis start to occupy the whole country and pass new anti-Jewish laws which are designed to exclude Jewish people from society and restrict their livelihood. The systematic deportations of Dutch Jews to death camps start in July 1942. However, because some Dutch citizens cannot bear to see what is happening to their country and people, they join the resistance. Among them is a young woman who will become the Nazi's most wanted woman in the Netherlands during World War II. Her name is Hanni Schaft. Hanni Schaft was born as Janneke Johanna Schaft on the 16th of December 1920 in Haarlem, the Netherlands. Hanni had an older sister, Annie, who tragically died from diphtheria at the age of seven. In part because of that, her parents raised Hanni with great caution and kept a close eye on her. Honey developed a political consciousness from a young age. Both parents followed world affairs and discussed these openly at the dinner table, also with their daughter. Her father, Peter Schaft in particular, was an active supporter of the Social Democratic Workers' Party, or SDAP, and conveyed his leftist tendencies to Honey. Guided by her socialist parents from early on, not only did she develop a strong sense of social justice, but also a deep hatred of fascism. While Honey was open and talkative at home, at school she remained rather quiet. Her bright red hair also made her the target of teasing and mockery. After high school in Harlem, in 1938 Honey started attending the University of Amsterdam in the hopes of becoming a human rights lawyer. During her university studies, she became friends with the Jewish students Sonja Frank and Felina Pollack, which made her feel strongly about actions against Jews. World War II started on the 1st of September 1939, when Nazi Germany invaded Poland. Already in the early stages of the war, Hani's resistance spirit began to show, and through the Red Cross, she started sending food and other supplies to imprisoned Polish soldiers. On the 10th of May 1940, Germany invaded the Netherlands. Soon after, a civil administration was installed under the SS auspices, and Artur Zeisinkwart was appointed Reich Commissar of the Netherlands. Among his first steps was a series of laws posing economic discriminations against the Jews. During 1940, the German occupation authorities banned Jews from the civil service and required Jews to register the assets of their business enterprises. In January 1941, the German authorities required all Jews to register themselves as Jews. The Germans claimed that the requirement that all Jews register was for their own safety. But the truth was that it enabled their future deportations, as the Nazis could easily track them down. A total of 159,806 persons were registered, including 19,561 persons born of mixed marriages. The total number included some 25,000 Jewish refugees from the German Reich. A Jewish council was established in February 1941. Around this time, Hani founded a debate group, Gemma, where critiques against the Nazi occupation and anti-Semitism were frequent topics of discussion. She also started writing articles in the university paper, criticizing the segregation of Jewish students and teachers, who were later banned from the campus. On the 22nd and 23rd of February, 1941, German forces raided the Jewish quarter in Amsterdam, arresting and deporting more than 400 Jewish men to the Buchenwald and Mauthaus in concentration camps. The Dutch people's reaction was unique among the Nazi-occupied Europe. They organized the February strike, a two-day general strike, which started on the 25th of February 1941. German officials brutally suppressed the strike. This action was followed by a hardening in Nazi policy. The German authorities, as well as collaborating Dutch authorities and civil services, segregated Jews from the general Dutch population and incarcerated 15,000 of them in German-administered forced labor camps. The Germans then ordered the concentration of Jews in Amsterdam and sent foreign and stateless Jews to the Westerbork transit camp in the northeastern part of the country. Some of the remaining provincial Jews were sent to the Fucht camp. 
The sign Forbidden for Jews appeared on the doors and gates of cafes, swimming pools, sports fields, museums, zoos, libraries, theatres, markets, and many other public places. Jews had to hand over their valuables, and their businesses were confiscated. Regulations which forced Jews to wear a yellow Star of David on their clothing as a means of identification were announced in the Netherlands on the 29th of April, 1942. Those caught without a badge after the 5th of May when they came into effect were arrested and detained for a six-week period to serve at Mauthausen. In the Netherlands, everyone knew that this was a death sentence. Deportations of Jews from the Netherlands began in July 1942. The last train left Westerbork for Auschwitz on the 3rd of September 1944. During these two years, the Germans and their Dutch collaborators deported some 107,000 Jews, mostly to Auschwitz and Sorbibor, where they were murdered. Only 5,200 survived. In addition, 25 to 30,000 Jews went into hiding, assisted by the Dutch underground, and two-thirds of those managed to survive. In 1943, university students were required to sign a declaration of allegiance to the occupation authorities. When Schaft refused to sign the petition in support of the occupation forces, like 80% of the other students, she could not continue her studies, and in the summer of 1943, she moved in with her parents again, taking her Jewish friends, Sonja Frank and Felina Polak, with her. She managed to obtain fake IDs for them to evade Nazi checkpoints, as the Nazis continued stripping Jewish citizens of their basic rights. Upon leaving university, Honey joined the Council of Resistance, a movement that had close ties to the Communist Party of the Netherlands. Whilst at the resistance, she met two sisters, Trus and Freddy Oversteger, with whom she became close friends and who would survive the war. Despite being young and female, they formed a famous trio in the Dutch resistance, feared by German occupiers as well as by Dutch Nazi collaborators. Hani, who was pursuing a career in human rights law, served as the intellectual member. Trus emerged as their decisive and practical leader, and the feminine and fierce Freddy would map out their missions. The armed resistance was an extremely dangerous activity, with many fighters arrested and executed. Rather than act as a courier, Schaft wanted to work with weapons. She was responsible for sabotaging and assassinating various targets. It is unclear how many attacks can be attributed to Honey, but it is believed there are at least six. Before confronting her targets, she would put on makeup including lipstick and mascara and style her hair. She once explained her reasoning to Truss Oversteger, I'll die clean and beautiful. Hani and the Oversteger sisters gathered vital information, provided Jewish children with safe houses, stole identification papers, and bombed railways. Hani could speak fluent German, and with Truss and Freddy she became involved with German soldiers. They would seduce high-ranking Nazi officers, lure them into the woods, and kill them. Honey was also involved in killing or wounding a baker who was known for betraying people, a hairdresser who worked for the Nazis' intelligence agency, and another Nazi police officer named Willem Zergze. Soon she became famous as the girl with the red hair and was placed on the Nazis' most wanted list. Adolf Hitler had personally ordered her capture. Honey and the Oversteger sisters would target mostly Nazi officers but also Dutch collaborators who gave the Nazis details of Jewish and dissident families. They did, however, refuse to target the children of high-ranking Nazis. When they were asked by their resistance commanders to kidnap the three children of Reich Commissioner Arthur Zeisinquart, they refused and argued, Resistance fighters do not kill children. We only fight against real fascists, not against children. Honey also worked closely with one of the founders of the resistance, Jan Bornekamp, whom she admired greatly. Bornekamp was charismatic, fearless, and good-looking and the two are rumored to have had a romantic relationship. On the 21st of June 1944, Hanis Haft and Jan Bornekamp carried out an assassination on a Dutch police officer and collaborator, Willem Ragut. Hani fired first and hit Ragut in the back, but Bornekamp was shot in the stomach by Ragut before killing him. Willem Ragut died nevertheless, and the two resistance fighters fled in different directions. But while Hani managed to get away, the fatally hurt Bornekamp was arrested and taken to the hospital. Whilst there, he unintentionally gave Honey's name and address to the Dutch Nazi nurses, who were pretending to be resistance workers. Soon after, Jan Bornekamp died from his injuries, and a week later, Nazis raided Honey's parents' house and sent her parents to a Dutch concentration camp. Honey, overwhelmed with grief, nearly turned herself in, but resistance members ordered her to stay with the Overstechers until she calmed down. 
She then temporarily stopped working for the Resistance due to the distress of the situation and her grief over Bonacup's death. When her parents were released several months later, she decided to return to the Resistance. She disguised herself by dyeing her hair black and wearing wireframe glasses. She once again contributed to assassinations and sabotage, as well as courier work and the transportation of illegal weapons and the dissemination of illegal newspapers. But her dedication was short-lived. On the 21st of March, 1945, Hanischaft was caught during a police patrol, while in possession of two resistance-friendly newspapers and a pistol. She was arrested and brought to a prison in Amsterdam, where she was tortured and interrogated. When forced to wash her hair, the Nazis knew they had finally found the red-haired assassin they'd been searching for for over two years. Although at the end of the war, there was an agreement between the occupier and the Dutch resistance to stop executions, the Nazis nevertheless decided to kill her. Hannes Haft was executed by Nazi officials Matthäus Schmitz and Martin Kaper only three weeks before the liberation. When in the dunes of Overveen, near Blumendal, Matthäus Schmitz leveled his gun at Honey, the first bullet which struck her in the head, only wounded her. Schaft was still standing when she said her final words, which were allegedly, I shoot better, before she was hit with another bullet, shot by Martin Kaper, that killed her. Honey Schaft was only 24 years old when she died on the 17th of April, 1945. The Netherlands was liberated from the Nazi occupation only 18 days later, on the 5th of May, 1945. The dunes where Schaft was killed became a mass grave for over 400 Dutch resistance fighters, including Hanni Schaft herself. On the 27th of November, 1945, Schaft was reburied in a state funeral at the Dutch Honorary Cemetery Bloemendal. Members of the Dutch government and royal family attended, including Queen Wilhelmina, who called Schaft the symbol of resistance. Following her death, Honey became known as one of the bravest resistance fighters of World War II, both in the Netherlands and abroad. Supreme Allied Commander Dwight Eisenhower awarded Honey a posthumous Medal of Freedom. Her legacy suffered during the Cold War because of her communist ties, though. Most recently, however, in 2020, Deputy Prime Minister Kaiser Ollongren honored her for the 100-year celebration of her birthday. Ollongren said, Honey fought for liberty and a society in which everyone has the right to participate. Her life teaches us that we must not look away from the fight against evil. There were many tears shed for Hanni's Haft. Thanks for watching the World History Channel. Be sure to like and subscribe, and click the bell notification icon so you don't miss our next episodes. We thank you and we'll see you next time on the channel.